Good evening, everyone. Wow, what a great crowd. It's good to see all of you here tonight. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the Marriott Library. I'm Alberta Comer, Dean of this wonderful library and university librarian here at the Utah University. This lecture, which is the fourth on women of the 20th century, is co-sponsored by the Friends of the Marriott Library, the Clyde Legacy Advisory Board, and the Marriott Library. I'm pleased to report that the program remains successful in attracting and acquiring collections and has had increased financial support from donors. The public continues to tell the advisory board and the library that the focus on such an important archive is long overdue and very highly valued. To date, and these are impressive numbers, so make sure you're impressed, the archive includes 105 collections of correspondence, journals, and scrapbooks, as well as more than 100 oral history interviews, 287 photograph collections, and 193 film and audio recordings. Some of the most recent contributions include the Francis Johnson Chase Papers, the Pauline Clyde Pace Papers, and the Susan R. Madsen Papers, as well as many others. Please join me now in acknowledging the extraordinary efforts of Eileen H. Clyde and the advisory board members who have worked diligently to ensure the success of the archives and this lecture series. The board members include, in addition to Ms. Clyde, Carol Lee Hawkins, Chair, Dr. Marie Cornwall, Dr. Cece Foxley, Kevin Clyde, Ken Okasaki, and Dr. Gregory Prince. Would the board members please stand now and be recognized? And since she didn't stand the first time around, I want special recognition for Miss Eileen Clyde. Would you please stand? <laughs> We're very pleased to work with her. She's our special and wonderful friend, and she has done so much in helping to develop this <coughs> program. She's a stellar example of an individual whose accomplishments have helped to shape the story of women in the 20th century. Her career includes her work as an educator and community leader, <coughs> as well as that of being a wife and mother. In her 60 plus year record of providing leadership and advice, she has helped many women achieve their potential. The record of her experience is set in the roles she has played as the first citizen chair of the Utah Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice and chair of the Utah Task Force on Gender and Justice in the Utah Courts. She served as vice chair of the Utah State Board of Regents <coughs> for 12 years. Ms. Clyde was the chair of the Coalition for Utah's Future and served in the general presidency of the Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The goal of the Eileen H. Clyde 20th Century Women's Legacy Archive is to identify women such as Ms. Clyde, who have helped to create social and cultural change during the 20th <coughs> century. This initiative has dramatically enhanced the library's research holdings and capabilities for our faculty and students and the larger community. Increasingly, the materials we are receiving that document the lives and actions of individuals and institutions are digitally born and will be used by researchers in this format. It's a challenge for archivists to not only collect this material, but to catalog, preserve, and make it easily accessible. Our keynote speaker is a perfect scholar to help us understand the rise of the digital record and the importance of preserving the materials in this format. Dr. Diane Harris is the Dean of the College of Humanities here at the U, where she's also a professor in the History Department. She holds a PhD in architectural history from the University of California at Berkeley. Her scholarship, which has a broad temporal and geographic reach spanning from 18th century Lombardy to the post-war United States, is united by a constant interest in the relationship between the built environment and the construction of racial and class identities. 
she is particularly well known for her scholarly contributions to the study of race and space. Focusing on the visual, the material, and the spatial, her work consistently seeks answers to questions about the way representations, objects, and built forms, such as cities, buildings, and landscapes, contribute to the formation of social and cultural histories. In addition to her numerous scholarly articles, her award-winning publications include the co-edited volumes, Villas and Gardens in Early Modern Italy and France, and Sights and Scene, Landscape and Vision. She's the author of The Nature of Authority, Villa Culture, Landscape and Representation in 18th Century Lombardy, and Maybeck's Landscapes, Drawing in Nature. Her most recent book, Little White Houses, How the Postwar Home Constructed Race in America, was published in 2013. Dean Harris is past president of the Society of Architectural Historians, for whom she also served as editor-in-chief for a major Mellon Foundation-funded digital humanities initiative called Sahara. She is editor for the University of Pittsburgh's Press Culture, Politics, and the Built Environment series. She served on the advisory board for the study of American architecture at Columbia University from 2009 to 2012 and as chair of that board from 2012 to 2015. She's also the recipient of a 2006 Iris Foundation Award from the Bard Graduate Center in New York for outstanding scholarly contributions in the history of art, decorative arts, and cultural history. She's been the principal investigator for several large grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, including a $3 million grant to create Humanities Without Walls, which is a consortium of humanity centers at 15 research, ex research extensive universities throughout the Midwest and beyond. Dean Harris currently serves on the board of the National Humanities Alliance and the Utah Humanities Council. And in 2016, she was nominated by President Barack Obama to serve on the National Council of the Humanities. Welcome, Dean Harris. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I think I'm mic'd up okay. Good. Well, good evening. It is such a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Um, such an honor. I want to thank uh, the, the Clyde family. Uh, it's really just a privilege to be here uh, to give this lecture tonight. And I want to especially thank Dean Alberta Comer, who is a fabulous collaborator uh, for the College of Humanities and a wonderful, gifted, creative, thoughtful, imaginative dean for the Marriott Library. We're so lucky to have her. Um, and to Greg Thompson, who uh, sent me this invitation um, uh, over the summer to be this year's Clyde Lecture. Greg and all the staff at this library have been just superb to work with in the short time I've been here, and I'm very, very grateful for what they do every day. Like many of you, I've long been a fan of libraries and librarians, but never more so than right now, in this tumultuous and difficult time in our nation's history. In peaceful times, we may simply think of librarians as human gateways to and guardians of information and our cultural heritage, as the often brilliant scholars of information science, and as the generous colleagues who help us and our students every day as we seek an answers to an enormous range of questions and research problems. Increasingly, we faculty also think of them as research and teaching partners. But we should be aware that librarians are also key participants in the preservation of democracy, and that they've long played an important role in the preservation not just of books, documents, and special collections, but also of our privacy, our intellectual freedoms, and indeed, our civil rights. As a recent article in The Guardian noted, libra libraries in the Trump era are serving as important sanctuary spaces for immigrants. Librarians are verifying facts and are authenticating web content for their patrons. They're hosting community conversations, working to counter efforts at censorship, and preserving endangered data, and importantly, our access to that data. Librarians fight for the preservation of their patrons' privacy, remembering that data privacy may well become an even greater issue in the months and years to come, and for the right to information for all Americans. As the American Library Association recently stated, quote, 
our nation's 120,000 public, academic, school, and special libraries serve all communi community members, including people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, and the most vulnerable in our communities, offering services and educational resources that transform communities, open minds, and promote inclusion and diversity. They are also, as one librarian put it, making America read again, and, uh, which is its own wonderful brand, I think, of power, um, powerful resistance. In short, libraries like the one we are sitting in right now are great bastions of democracy, and we need to thank and salute our wonderful librarians for the work they do every day. So just a preamble, I salute you. Thank you, Marriott librarians. Tonight, I'm going to focus on three of my own research projects, a bit of a, a little bit of a, bio, a sort of a, a biography of my intellectual trajectory to demonstrate how they might not have developed as they did were it not for the fact that someone, somewhere, at some point in time, saved everything, and then realized they needed to find a way to preserve and make available what they had saved. I chose the title of my lecture tonight with the hope that many would recognize it is somewhat tongue in cheek especially the librarians in the room, whom I do not wish to panic, and who know that we, of course, cannot save everything, lest we become, like this image, slowly or even rapidly buried by the material evidence of our own cultural production. But what I hope we will see is that the making of exciting, creative, rich histories relies very heavily on the hope that somewhere, someone was a hoarder that the odd bits and scraps of the past made it into someone's dark and hopefully dry and insect-free drawer or closet, preferably on acid-free paper, and thence to a wonderful library like this one. That someone realized that a scrap of paper, a doodle, doodle scribbled on the back of an envelope, a bit of text from a public address, a copy of an old advertisement might all be useful and of importance to a historian in the future. So let's see, now I have to figure out how to advance the slide. There we go. I should mention two anecdotes at the outset that make me particularly pleased to have been asked to give this evening's lecture. First, that my first ever peer-reviewed journal article came from the opportunity to work as a student in what was then UC Berkeley's documents collection, now known as the Environmental Design Archives. And what you see here in this image is what that collection used to look like in the old days when it was just a little room little dusty old room at the top of the Environmental Design Library before that was all remodeled and made fancy. So this is where my student job was. Now amazingly, I was given my own key and free access to that collection in 1987 when I was a master's student getting my master's degree in architecture. And back when that collection was run by students and a faculty member without the expertise of the highly skilled archivists led by Waverly Lowell, who now have made it into a world-class and beautifully preserved collection. I've long credited my passion for archival work from that wonderful, exceptional experience. Being able to spend whatever free time I had browsing the drawings and papers from some of the most famous architects of California's past was just transformative for me, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Second, my second ever peer-reviewed journal article examined late 19th century and early 20th century books about gardening written by women for women a project based on the special and rather rare collection of garden history texts that were once part of the personal library belonging to a woman named Beatrix Jones Ferrand, an extraordinary woman who became a founding member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, also incidentally the niece of Edith Wharton, and the designer of many beautiful campus landscapes, an early version of the White House Rose Garden, and the grounds of Dumbarton Oaks, among others. So my own connection to archives and to women's history are really at the root of my very earliest work as a scholar. And I should say that this is just a sampling of some of those books on the screen. Some of their, them are tinies. They're like this big. Um, they're beautifully hand illustrated or hand painted, gorgeous little books. And this connected to my first degree, which was in landscape architecture. So I was interested in looking at landscape history and architectural history. So as I mentioned, my first exposure to working in an archive was that that dusty room um, from 1987 to 1989 when I held a graduate assistantship in that archive. And at that time, again, no professional archivist existed since the collection had been assembled by architectural history faculty with a passion for and an understanding that it would be important to rescue and save 
the drawings and papers of California architects, landscape architects, and urban planners. So for those of you who, I know there's at least one architect in the room who will know these names. Um, the collection included works by Charles and Henry Sumner Green, William Worcester, Catherine Bauer, Ernest Coxhead, Joe Escherich, Willis Polk, Julia Morgan, Garrett Ekbo, Robert Royston, Thomas Church, and many others. These are big names in the design world. So for me, a key point of discovery came from browsing through the collection of perhaps one of Northern California's most eccentric but beloved designers, the man you see here, Bernard Ralph Maybeck, who practiced in California between 1892 and 1940. If you've spent any time in the Bay Area, you might know some of his most famous works. The extraordinarily beautiful Palace of Fine Arts, which he designed for the Panama Pacific International Exposition of 1915. You see that here, or the recreation of that here or his first Church of Christ scientist in Berkeley from 1910. In addition, he designed uh, dozens, oh, and this is just the interior of that church, really extraordinary building. Um, he also designed dozens of craftsman-style houses for the North Berkeley Hills, hotels, clubhouses, a Packard Auto showroom in Oakland, and much more. Well, Maybeck has always been known as an architect, um, as a designer trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris to design buildings and urban settings. But given the opportunity to pull open drawer after drawer of his project drawings, I discovered something else. Um, and this particular drawing is one of the first that caught my attention. Maybeck was also a prolific and inventive designer of landscapes. In fact, what my research showed was that Maybeck's architecture had to be examined along with his designs for their landscapes in order to be properly understood, because so much of his work resulted from an inventive integration of architecture and landscape. Now, this is far from the kinds of questions that I now ask as a scholar, but it was very important to me. This was actually my master's thesis project, and so I was looking, how could I take what I knew as an undergraduate in landscape architecture and think about what it meant in terms of architecture and bring these things together with my growing interest in becoming a historian? So uh, I, could, I could talk at some length about his exuberant, beautiful, and engaging projects, many of which are beautifully, but unfortunately for their preservation, rendered like the one you see here with colored pastel chalk on highly acidic brown craft paper. Yeah, all the librarians are just going, oh, no, that's awful, right? And they're extraordinary. They're big. They're big, big, big drawings. Uh, this one was particularly uh, neat to find because it shows uh, an architect who's thinking about structural engineering, architecture, and landscape, all of the very conceptual beginnings of a project. And that's just kind of unusual to see that in one kind of beginning conceptual sketch. Um, so, and here you can see, this is that looking the other direction in that old dusty documents collection that I love so dearly that doesn't look like this anymore. And if you look up in the upper right corner, you'll see some drawings rolled up at the top of the filing cabinets. Those were huge, big, beautiful um, chalk, chalk pastel drawings on craft paper of amazing designs that Maybeck came up with. And to look at them, you had to unroll them on a big, long table, and they would literally crackle as you unrolled them, and the chalk would kind of puff up into the air. Um, so this is bad. This is not what you want to have happen. So here's where we can be especially thankful for digitization, because these drawings really can't be and shouldn't be much handled, and now they're not. They're, <laughs> I want to just say for Waverly Lowell's, uh, on her behalf, she has made this into a world-class, beautifully preserved, beautifully conserved collection. It is no longer like this. She is a genius. But one important discovery in that project um, that Maybeck study happened because someone saved everything, or at least something important, for what was my uh, MARC thesis and for a later published book. In 1909, Maybeck designed this large residence for the prominent and wealthy Leon Roos family in San Francisco's Pacific Heights neighborhood. And you can see that it's quite substantial, a big house. Um, this is Maybeck's drawing for it, and it's really a shining example of the arts and crafts era movement as it was expressed in Northern California and its total design ethics since Maybeck designed the house, its furnishings, light fixtures, a family crest, decorative gardens around the house, and a formal vegetable garden on an adjacent lot that was once part of the property. When the family sold the property, the rear garden was destroyed, and all that remained in the archives was Maybeck's plan drawing, the one you see here, one of the few he made with such detail. Because there was no other evidence, no other drawings, no written descriptions, I wondered whether the garden had, in fact, ever existed. Perhaps, I thought, it was simply conceptual, because a lot of his work was. He liked to do a lot of sort of fantasy projects. 
The only way to find out was to approach the family and see if anyone knew. Fortunately, uh, Leslie Roos, the daughter of Leon Roos, then still owned the house, and she'd kept some old family photos of that very garden, the only surviving evidence of a very ephemeral form. Landscape is an extremely ephemeral form to study, uh, because even in the, the best of circumstances, anyone who, who gardens knows how rapidly landscapes transform, become overgrown, die, and can be lost. So for me, those photos were an important revelation because it helped me understand one facet of this architect's career that had not been previously known. And it was a lesson in the importance of everyday citizen archivists who are often the keepers of the past through their preservation of family photo albums and journals, among other things. So please, all of you, be good archivists. Save your photos, be careful with them, and think about your born digital photos. I promised Craig Thompson I'd say that. So be very, very careful with what you're doing with your, your iPhone camera. So I was able to turn over copies of the photos to the archives. The Roos family gave them to me so they could be part of the archives. So they're now integrated into that collection. And it's quite clear to me that whoever made the photo of this woman, probably a Roos family member in her garden, never imagined that it would become important evidence for a fledgling architectural historian. So that's just an early example from my own career, one that showed me how ordinary family possessions can come to hold importance beyond their original intentions, such as a simple family photograph made on an afternoon in a garden. It's also an example of analog architectural history, work performed before the advent of digitization and digital collections. Well, digitization is now, um, as we all know, a ubiquitous set of technologies. Um, and we are all now curators of our own histories, documenting everything we do every day with our camera phones, posting to social media, and creating vast amounts of digital content every day. Historians still produce histories from books and papers found in archives, but also now from digital codes assembled into complex combinations of zeros and ones retrieved with algorithms, organized as layers of data and metadata. This digital content is, as Abby Smith Rumsey reminds us, ubiquitous yet unimaginably fragile, limitless in scope yet inherently unstable. We currently possess no knowledge about how to permanently store, preserve, and make enduringly accessible most digital content. Code can be overwritten, platforms and software become obsolete, Servers are hacked and they have lim limited lifespans, backup systems fail, and the whole depends on a power system that is itself more uncertain than we wish to consider. Yet digitization has also made work possible that could not previously have been imagined. There's no question that anyone with access to the internet can and has benefited from the digitization of a wide variety of collections that were previously available only to those who could visit an archive or a special collection. Through the creation of large digital collections of primary sources, and I'm showing you just the logos from some here, such as Ebo, Early English Books Online, the Hathi Trust, the Wellcome Trust, and ProQuest, to just name a very few examples, there are now literally millions of digitized books, newspapers, maps, films, images, and other historical artifacts available for anyone to study. As digitization processes and digital display platforms have improved, it's become possible to access very high quality replications of the originals, sometimes to see things we could not see with the naked eye or on the analog page. This is a tremendous boon for scholars and students who wish to study parts of a collection located in a distant location or parts of a collection that were formerly deemed too fragile, like those drawings I just talked about, or too rare to permit direct access. So, digitization might be seen to represent a tremendous move forward for the democratization of knowledge in as much as it affords greater access to content. It also would seem to solve the problem of wanting to save everything, since digital storage is much less space consuming. It might also make us wonder whether, in this digital era, we need to actually save the original paper or hard copies or artifacts that have been digitized. Why bother to store all that old dusty stuff that's fragile and takes a lot of space if we can have a high quality digital replica stored on reliable hard drives that take a lot less space? Do we need to save everything if we no longer actually need the thing itself? As the scholar of digital, digital culture and early modern collecting Bonnie Mack has demonstrated, 
the relationship between digital objects and the original artifact from which they're made is complex and ambiguous. What we have to remember is that a digitization is not an original, nor is it an exact replica of an original, but is instead a digitally encoded version of the original. It's more like an altered facsimile, a fraternal rather than an identical twin. Digital objects are made up of relatively unstable layers of digital content that change over time. They, uh, we have to think about them, though. It's kind of helpful to visualize them as these layered artifacts that we can't really see. They include metadata that is not objectively produced, which can include errors that are difficult to catch and thus occlude the pursuit of scholarly truths, and which can reinscribe cultural biases and hierarchies without making them visible. So for example, what if a librarian entering metadata says something is made by, uh, by a woman, but actually the name is gender nonspecific? Or what if the artist themselves is gen is gender, uh, non has a different gender identity and women wouldn't catch that? So there's just all kinds of ways in which entering metadata, that's just one example, right? But that's one way that metadata can inscribe cultural biases and hierarchies, and we can't really see that, and searches then cause problems. Digital scans just trans thus transmit their own ideas without transparently doing so. And this is something about which digital humanists and librarians are now growing particularly aware. Moreover, the digitization process itself involves making choices that can impact the presentation of the digitized objects in ways that can misrepresent the original artifact. Now, let me show you an example from another project that started as my dissertation and became the subject of my first book, a project that examined 18th century Lombard villa culture by starting with a set of prints produced by a Milanese printmaker named Marc Antonio Del Rey. And we're going to look at the volume in a minute in a very cool way, but I'm going to start by just showing you these kinds of uh, just still images of it. So in 1726, Del Rey produced a remarkable volume titled Villa di Dilizia Oceano Palagi Campareci nello Stato di Milano, or for short, Villas of Delight, depicting through a series of richly detailed renderings and written descriptions, eight villas belonging to the nobility and located around Milan and throughout the province of Lombardy, which was at that time a valuable, very valuable Habsburg territory due to its abundant agro-productivity, leading one writer to call the territory at the time the Indies of the Court of Vienna. Del Rey later produced two additional volumes that we're not going to look at. Um, he made those in 1743 that depicted some additional estates for a total of 12 and replicated views of those in this volume I'm showing you here, this 1726, though he produced them in altered form and format. Now, we don't know how many copies of the Delizia exist since the convention of numbering prints didn't come into practice until the 19th century, but they are rare now housed largely in European and U.S. archives and special collections, though at least two copies are also currently in private American collections of very wealthy collectors. And I just want to show you, this is what those villas now look like. Well, this is what they looked like as of about 1993-94. Um, you can see these canals running in front of the villas. They're kind of these big, hulking, uh, ghost-like villas out in the landscape of, of the Lombard Plain, which is a rice-growing region, so it's very flat and very wet. Um, and these canals were called navili, and um, they were so abundant that at one time Lombardy and Milan was more like Venice than like any other city in, in the Italian peninsula. So very, very interesting landscape. Um, so uh, here we go. So the, the 1726 volume is the extraordinary tome, since it's distinct, it is distinctive in several ways. Del Rey produced it before his shop came into possession of a letterpress. So all the descriptions, which I'll show you in a few minutes, had to be handwritten backwards on large copper plates, an exercise that also had to be performed without touching the hand or arm to the plate in order to avoid marring the plate's ground and creating foul biting or unwanted marks on the final prints. It's quite a feat, actually. But the most well-known and notable hallmark of the 1726 volume are the panoramic perspective views, like the one you see here that Del Rey created for each villa elaborate multi-plate prints that require unfolding from the folio in order to be seen and appreci appreciated. And what I'm showing you here in this view um, is one of those panoramic views. It's sitting on a great big library table in the rare books collection at Dumbarton Oaks. Um, so you can see the bottom scallop of the table there. And so this is actually the print 
still inside the book binding. It's just been folded out multiple times to create this beautiful, quite grand panorama. So the panoramas appear at the end um, of a compendium of information assembled for each villa, including written descriptions and a series of plans and elevation views. The theatrical quality of the panoramas in the 1726 edition, delineated with the use of startling angles and deeply receding perspective, is enhanced by the drama of unfolding prints for viewing, a necessity that incorporates an element of surprise for first-time viewers who may be unaware that these prints comprise two or three large copper plate images joined together and folded to fit within the binding of the folio. The panoramas impart a sense of grandeur as the scene literally unfolds, slowly revealing the landscape as the viewer assembles the scene before her eyes. Each folio is large, approximately 46 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So I'd say when the book is closed, it's about like this, carrying it, sort of carrying it around. It's like it's a hefty big thing. Um, so it has to be viewed on a table so the panoramas can be unfolded, but it's also just too kind of large and heavy to hold on your lap. Turning the pages requires extended arm motions um, and even sort of stepping back and forth or sideways to unfold those plates. So unlike a book of common size that fits in a reader's lap or on a small table, opening the Delizia is an event. The book itself a spectacle. The folded prints were meant to be examined at close range, pored over, their details examined, descriptions and titles studied, the minutia of their subjects admired. I could tell you I could spend all day looking at these. They're so much fun. So here's another one of those panoramic views. Produced during the enlightened absolutism that became the cultural and political Habsburg hallmark of that time, the prints are complex documents that tell us much about 18th century life in a colonized landscape marked by a political struggle and profound environmental change. They're not useful as documents that tell us about the actual form of the estates they purport to represent because they're highly and intentionally distorted views. For the patrons who commissioned and collected the prints, Del Rey's views bolstered family image and identity even as the Habsburg's enlightenment social and economic reforms threatened title and position. During the decade I worked on this project, digital scans of the Villa di Delizia did not yet exist. Just hadn't, that hadn't really been invented yet. So instead, I studied the originals at the Getty Research Institute, at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C., at the State Archives in Milan, Como, and in Pavia, and at the Raccolta Bertarelli, which is a print collection in Milan, and the La Scala Museum. Yes, the place where you go to see opera. They have a lot of these prints there because the people who lived in these villas were patrons of La Scala. Um, so I went there. I went to the Hof Bibliothek in, in Vienna, which has a fabulous print collection, and looked at this in the Cavagna collection in the Rare Books and Manuscript Library at the University of Illinois and in the private collections of Bunny Mellon at her Oak Spring Garden Library, and in the collection of a woman named Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, who has a substantial collection of rare garden books. I also relied on a facsimile edition produced by a Milanese publisher. That facsimile is, again, one of those kind of fraternal twins I mentioned earlier, not an exact replica. And I also worked with photographs that the Getty allowed me to make for study purposes. It was painstaking work. And it was expensive. It was also a lot of fun. So now I'm going to ask Angela to help me switch so we can look at something in the Hathi Trust. Um, this is just super fun. So she's just going to take a minute so I don't mess it up. And there we are. OK, so we're now looking at, I mentioned that big database. We're looking at the Hathi Trust, um, which has these millions of digitized volumes in it that have been produced through agreements with various institutions. And um, what's so great is that today it's possible to view Del Rey's Villa Prints online. And we're looking at the Getty's copy here. So a simple Google image search reveals numerous scans of highly varied quality um, uh, that you can find of the Del Rey. But this is really exciting to be able to find this. And the Hachi Trust Digital Library is a partnership of academic and research institutions offering a collection of millions of titles uh, digitized from, a li from libraries around the world. I'm accessing this through the Marriott Libraries portal. We're very, very lucky to have access to the Hathi Trust collection here at the University of Utah. It is quite simply an extraordinary scholarly resource. So let's take a look at the Hathi Trust digitized copy of the Villa di Delizia. So I'm going to just walk you through it a little bit here. We're looking at the front cover and uh, see if I can just move us through it. Oh, this is interesting. 
In my laptop, we have page turning software. I wonder why I'm seeing it this way. I wonder if I'm doing something wrong. When you look at it on my laptop, it uses page turning software that just moves it this way, right? But we'll just leaf through it anyway. So we're seeing that on the left-hand side of the page, there's some annotation that the owner of this uh, copy once included, and they pasted a photograph of the Villa Simonetta on the front. So that's whoever had this before the Getty did, did a little tinkering with the volume. Um, I really think we need to see the other view, and I, I'm going to go to this and see if that helps. Okay, let's see if we can, now we've got it. There we go. Okay, so we're a few pages in now. And this is the beautiful uh, frontispiece, which has a, 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 a the wonderful view representing, uh, allegorical view representing the rivers uh, and the Navili in Milan, a Phaeton allegory up in the corner that's talking about the Habsburgs and it's got a lot of stuff going on there. And then way in the background where I'm going to point right here with my arrow, that's the skyline of Milan. And we flip through and we get to the title page and you'll see that it's written in both Italian and in French. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and it's dedicated to Prince Eugene of Savoy, the Habsburg monarch. So we have his portrait there and then a dedication to the prince. And then this is to the reader, a little story to the reader about what they're going to encounter. Uh, and then we begin with the description. So for each villa, we start with a description, we get a plan view, we get an elevation, more architectural elevations and details. I'm going to flip rather quickly here. Some garden views, uh, details of garden ornament and so on. I'm going to flip this page and um, well, you can't really see it here too well, but uh, it depends on where we are. Sometimes you'll see on the backs of these, you can see this kind of um, stuff here. That's actually from when the printmaker uh, was drawing the prints, and he stacked them on top of each other, and that's ink from the one below that you're seeing right there. How do I know all this? Because I'm married to a fabulous world-class printmaker who's sitting right there <laughs> who told me all this. He helped me learn how to look at a print. Larry Hamlin, thank you. Um, and here you can see a big view, right? So then we're starting to see the big, big view. Um, let's keep going. I just want to show you a few more. But when we look at the panoramas, I'm going to quickly go to some panoramas here. Look what happens. Oh, darn. That's not quite the view I showed you folded out on the library table, right? OK, so we've got this. Now, first, as you can see, it's very hard to gain a sense of the physical properties of the volume itself. It's true size, weight, mass, and the quality of the paper through this digital version. The page turning software implemented here is great because it gives us at least a virtual experience of leaving through the book. However, it also distorts the thickness of each page. You can see when I turn it, it makes it look almost like cardboard turning, right? Making the leaves appear sturdier than they are in reality. So you don't get a sense of the quality of the paper. It's also great because you can zoom in and out to examine some details. We'll just do a little zoom right here. Right, we can go a little closer and go a little closer. Um, and we could go in even closer. But, but where things really fall apart is when we try to look at the panoramic views, which the digitization process simply can't emulate. Right, So we've got a problem here. We're not seeing the thing as it's meant to be seen. So let's also look at the metadata. If I can kind of zoom out again, and we'll go over here and look at the full catalog record. Okay, so it's really interesting that it's got it here listed um, with, uh, with its French title first. And that's weird because Del Rey was very much a printer of the, the Italian peninsula. Milan was his home. His shop was in Milan. The villas depicted are in Lombardy. And nearly everything he did was dictated by the cultural and geographic context of his life in and around Milan and on the Italian peninsula. He included the French text essentially as a continental marketing ploy as a way to connect more fully to the Habsburg rulers and to reach a broader market of grand tourists. But these are really prints of Italian villas made by an Italian printmaker whose French was really not very good. And he would just make up words when he didn't know what they were. It's actually really hilarious to read them. And that wasn't terribly uncommon practice, actually, at the time. So the metadata is, in that sense, somewhat misleading to those who might know little about the volume. It also erroneously describes the prints as engravings when, in fact, they are mostly etched and only seldom show any evidence of engraving. These are distinct artistic techniques, something fine art printmakers know well. But the distinction between an etching and an engraving would be harder to discern without being able to examine the original pages up close. Now, this actually matters because it helps us understand more about the means of production for these prints 
which also helps us know how many might have been produced and thus how widely circulated in their time. But we can, as you saw, examine the backs of the prints, so um, the software does let us do that. So we can see whether there are any annotations on the version. We can see the ink marks that resulted, as I showed you, when prints are stacked up on top of each other in the drawing process. And that's not a necessity for most historians, but it is something that, again, is part of the production of these images and really kind of makes them come to life. These are just a few of the ways the digitized version simply is not the same as reviewing the original, as viewing the original. Digital scans thus are facsimiles that, through the means of their production, become something not quite something quite new, while often looking like something quite old and original. As Bonnie Mack has written, the facsimile is designed to imitate, to emulate, to reproduce. It seduces readers into overlooking the physical differences between the reproduction and its exemplar, and nowhere, nowhere more acutely than in the digital environment, where the material incongruities between codex and computer should be most evident. Indeed, the relationship between the digitization and the object to which it refers is not necessarily a close one, and the extent of the imitation is by no means obvious. Digitizations are imitations, then, and not always closely made imitations. The digital version affords enormous convenience, but here's what it cannot afford the visceral, visceral, distinctly embodied experience of handling a material artifact. A book, a bulletin, a letter, a diary, a script, a map, a musical score, a drawing. It cannot replicate the experience of holding something in your hand, feeling its texture and weight, seeing the way it reflects the light, what Abby Rumsey again points to as the sacredness and undeniability of the tangible object. There is an ineffable quality to analog materials that simply cannot be replicated, and, there's evidence that only the, and there is evidence on them that only the analog can reveal. But do I wish I'd had access to that Getty version in the Hathi Trust when I been, began working on my project and all the way through it? Absolutely. It would have provided a tremendously helpful supplementary reference, and it can also now be useful for teaching. Though I still want students to see the original. I have no doubt that the platforms and software for viewing visual artifacts and books will steadily improve over time, but I suspect they will never fully approximate, approximate the object itself or the affordances scholars require for all their research needs that focus on a specific text or artifact. So Angela, can we go back to the PowerPoint? Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's look at just one more example. This one from my more recent, most recent book, Little White Houses, Big Leap Forward in Time. Um, that book is really a contribution to the history of fair housing in the US, a study of the way really ordinary suburban houses in the United States that were constructed between 1945 and 1960 reinforced ideas about the construction of white identities and specific kinds of social, economic, and political privilege. So it's a contribution to architectural history, but I also intended it as a contribution to the complex and difficult history of race and segregation in the post-war United States. And I'm talking about this kind of houses, really, really ordinary, ordinary post-war houses. It was a project that relied pretty heavily on a wide range of materials, including popular and shelter magazines, and shelter magazines are things like House Beautiful, House and Garden, things like that, on newspapers on advertisements like this one, um, on television network archives and television program transcripts, builder's documents, trade catalogs, photographic archives, and the drawings and ephemera located in some architectural archives, among others. So one part of the book, just one part of it, um, one of the major challenges uh, was to figure out um, all the stuff about storage that I kept reading about, because one of the challenges post-war homeowners faced was trying to find places to store all of their possessions in houses that frequently lack, lacked basements or attics, and in households that were replete with all the great things that could be easily purchased with the newly invented credit cards and easily available credit, and in a consumer market that overflowed with desirable goods. I wanted to understand the spatial and design ramifications of this new surplus consumer's republic, to use a phrase coined by the renowned Harvard historian Elizabeth Cohen, and its impact on race and class identity formation. But to do so also meant trying to figure out what exactly were Americans consuming. Like I knew there was stuff, but what was all this stuff? To get at that quite challenging question, 
I turned as I so often have during my research career to the person across from me at the dinner table, that printmaker, my spouse. So as we pondered this question together one evening, he remembered that his working class family obtained numerous household items through the use of trading stamps that were commonly collected by families across the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. <laughs> now I can hear by your chuckling that some of you who are my age or older likely remember these, S&H green stamps, blue chip stamps, gold bond trading stamps. My husband and I had that conversation in about 1997, before much digitization had occurred, so I had a problem then. How would I find the trading stamp redemption catalogs and records that would help me figure out what items working and middle class Americans wanted to obtain from their homes? Well, in the government documents section of the University of Illinois Library, where I was then a faculty member, I was able to find a set of records pertaining to legislation about the regulation of the tra trading stamp industry, an enlightening set of documents that helped me understand their currency and value in post-war culture and their impact on the national retail economy as well as providing records of the most popularly redeemed items. Those documents pointed me towards the gold bond, com gold bond company, and I was able to search for and locate newspaper microfilm, no fun looking at that, that included the inserts to a Sunday newspaper paper that had an abbreviated version of Gold Bond's redemption catalog printed in it. So I found that, but that was all. Thankfully, that project took a long time. My project evolved slowly enough that digitization caught up with it. Fast forward from the late 1990s to about a decade later, and trading stamp and redemption catalogs began to appear as digitized content that could be located with a simple Google search. And that's what you're seeing here, just screen grabs from a, a Google search. Better yet, the catalogs could be purchased very inexpensively on eBay, something I learned from my research assistant, because I would never have thought of that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so I made my own small collection from which to study the goods available. Those of us who grew up in the era of trading, trading stamps know that this is truly ephemeral stuff. The stamps littered kitchen drawers or were stored in a simple envelope or shoved into a jar before being pasted into the savings books and stored for later redemption at a center. I sincerely doubt that our parents or siblings considered the stamps or catalogs as historical evidence worth preserving. But I can tell you that these artifacts provided substantive evidence of post-war material life for two chapters of my book, probably because somewhere, someone saved everything. So, <laughs> save everything. Well, practically, we all know this is not possible. And I'm a practical person by nature. Libraries everywhere are running out of space. I've recently departed from a university where at least one of the smaller area libraries had become nearly unusable because of severe space limitations. And library facilities, especially those at the public research universities like this one that are one of our nation's greatest democratic achievements, simply cannot expand rapidly enough to accommodate the collections they now have, let alone those to come. The librarians I saluted at the beginning of this talk now face the nearly impossible task of safeguarding information and culture while simultaneously having to daily find themselves facing Cornellian dilemmas in which any course of action leads to another set of difficult problems. Our librarians endeavor every day to preserve as much as they can, and I want again to gratefully acknowledge the tremendously thoughtful care they give to making these decisions about the future of collections. So and again, save everything. Impossible, but save a lot? Absolutely, hopefully, please. As one of our own Marriott libraries, Randy Silverman has written, and as I've been trying to demonstrate, digital media will not make paper obsolete. He reminds us that, quote, only the authentic original can be a backup to accurately regenerate screen copies, be the master copy to augment, enhance, or correct faulty screen copies, and provide authentication to verify original production techniques and determine questions of provenance. Yet the selective and informed weeding of collections is inarguably necessary as our careful strategies for creating what we might refer to as what, and what I like to think of as a bibliogeography of hard copy or analog backups that are dispersed across the American landscape and storage facilities. The contents made accessible to all through robust sharing agreements and access policies and upon which we will need to rely, upon, uh, rely for all kinds of information in the future. Thus, Silverman's call for the creation of large national preservation repositories is a good and vitally important one that I hope can come to pass. 
and it echoes a resolution put for, forth by librarians Paula Kaufman and John Wilkin in 2011 to create a HathiTrust distributed print monographs archive. That resolution, which passed, proposes establishment of a distributed print archive of monographic holdings corresponding to volumes represented within HathiTrust that is then collectively supported by the HathiTrust membership. A great proposal, but one that has not yet made much progress as far as I can tell. This is a, a facility that would be like one of these big repositories. We could think of the construction of such repositories as the creation of a new kind of infrastructure for our country, one that is at once spatial and cultural. This is infrastructure we need, not a wall along the Mexican border, not a pipeline that irrecoverably damages the environment and sacred Native American landscapes, but an infrastructure that can preserve for all time and for all people the incredibly diverse, often controversial, indescribably beautiful, messy, complicated, fantastic, sublime, inspiring, educational, and infinitely fascinating artifacts of our intellectual, artistic, and cultural heritage, and that now resides somewhat precariously in our nation's libraries and special collections. This is an investment we need to make. Imagine how many state-of-the-art national preservation repositories could be built for the roughly estimated 15 to $25 billion Trump's wall may cost. We might see this as the natural extension of the national infrastructure that was first imagined by President John Adams when he signed the bill in 1800 that led to the establishment of the Library of Congress that was later more firmly established, as you know, by President Thomas Jefferson, who donated his own personal collection to replace the books that were destroyed when the first library collection was burned during the British invasion of 1814. So again, save everything. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson hoped we would. So did the first librarians of Congress and countless librarians who followed. Our founding fathers were wise, but they could not see the future. They could not see this future. Just as they imagined and planned for a range of political contingencies, they could not foresee the globalized 21st century, and they could not foresee the digital revolution. Had they done so, I feel certain they would have created the outlines of a plan for the long-term preservation of our cultural commonwealth. Since they did not, we certainly must. I'll just close then by citing a few words that are inscribed on the walls of the Library of Congress from Shakespeare's As You Like It, Act Two, Scene One, a passage that I think hints at the notion of the ubiquity of knowledge even as it also suggests its ephemerality. And I'm going to take it out of context um, as both buildings and non-Shakespeare, uh, as both architectural histories and non-Shakespeare scholars are wont to do. Tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Good in everything. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Could you use the mic, please? We're, we're uh, filming this. I remember pasting stamps in those books. And I just have to ask, we bought a picnic table that way yeah. at my house. <laughs> I just have to ask, how was that financed? Who was providing those when we turned in the stamps? I remember going to the yeah. store. Where did, that, where did all that stuff actually come from yes. when it was redeemed? So it pretty much worked the same way um, uh, airline points do now. It's really the same idea. It's just that instead of accumulating library points, you accumulated these stamps that you know you would fill up your tank with gas, and that if you filled it up ten dollars, you got so many stamps, right? So it was a sponsorship program, um, and these various companies worked closely with the postage stamp companies, just as hotels and and uh, you know different kinds of consumer goods participate now in different kinds of point systems. So it was basically the same idea, worked the same way. We got the penguin um, ice holder with them. <laughs> yeah. 
How you doing? Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, what is your, what do you think of people that believe that not all work should be saved, such as people that believe in burning books? Yeah. Like what? What do you? What are your thoughts on that? I'm against that. <laughs> well, do you think that all work should be saved? Yeah. Even the even even the works that those people believe in, like that read and of course yeah of course yes um, you know that is that is why we are uh, a, a democracy right is that we need to have all points of view all perspectives books that at one time are deemed deemed dangerous the next year are are classics right there are things that people thought should not be taught in schools in the 1950s that are books that we now think every child should read. So absolutely. And you know, the same everything thing, that's the hard part. And that's the what I was trying to convey is that our librarians are in such a difficult moment because they simply can't save everything. There's just no way. We would literally be buried and we wouldn't be able to access anything. But at the same time, we kind of need to save everything. So I think we're at a moment where, um, especially for uh, librarians who are encountering this and have been now for at least 20 years, 25 years, this new set of digital dilemmas where even if we want to save all digital content, we don't actually know how. I mean, if you take, for example, a map that's made with GIS software, that's again layers of different kinds of content in one file and those layers are unstable. They don't, as new, as new um, versions of that software become available, it's not necessarily even, evenly distributed new content, a new, new data across that one file. So learning how to preserve the various layers of any particular uh, format is itself enormously challenging. And you know, just think about, we all probably, many of us probably have an old large format floppy disk. Well, what do you do with that now, right? And yet there might be data on it that's tremendously important. Um, so these are just, these are, challenges. My question actually went to that a little bit. I mean, you were talking about, you've been talking about the transition from print or material object to digital object. Um, you've addressed that slightly, but maybe if you could talk a little bit to give advice to people who are creating digital content. Yeah. And beyond the archival question, mm -hmm. as you were talking about metadata, the kind of, the kind of added information that existed with books we're not even creating right now right. because I work in a digital landscape and I create content in a digital landscape. What advice would you have for creating something that's lasting and not ephemeral? You know, I wish I had a good answer to that. I'm, and I think there's probably librarians in the room who are more knowledgeable than I am. I will tell you that whatever I would tell you, I would be uh, saying do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't even want to think about my own photo collection at the moment. It's just horrifying. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that um, there are, right, I mean, the people I know who are kind of responsible about managing, for example, their personal photos um, are really diligent about uploading them to some sort of platform that allows them to manage that content. A lot of them use Flickr. Flickr has seemed to have been a good platform. I'm sure there's others that are good that people use. But one of the challenges with all of these platforms is that they're privately owned. Well, they're, they're, they're businesses. Um, so those businesses don't have necessarily any long range plan that's responsible to, to us. Um, so you know, we might, for example, as scholars even create a digital model that we use um, in a collaboration with um, Google, Google software. And Google seems pretty sturdy at the moment, but what will Google be in 20 years or 30 years? Do we know? We don't really know, right? So I was just um, telling, I'm just gonna reveal this little anecdote. I was talking to Richard Price from our English department about this earlier. Um, when I was working on my book about the Pennsylvania Levittown, I was looking for, um, there was a sort of a rare documentary that had been made in 1957 when there was a big race riot in that Levitt town when the first black family moved in. And um, at that time it wasn't, you know, there was, I couldn't find it anywhere online. And uh, through interlibrary loan, I found one copy of the original film and it was at Calumet College in Illinois. And I interlibrary loaned it and they sent the big film reel and it came with a big pink sash across it that said, do not return. And 
I called the librarian and I said, I don't understand. What do you mean? And he said, well, we're deaccessioning all of our, our films because we don't have any way to properly preserve them anymore and we don't have any way to project them anymore. So please just keep it and make use of it if you can. So I was pretty horrified. Um, I found somebody who had a projector and we figured out how to, I could see it, I watched it. Um, I then took it and had it digitized and returned, I gave the, I made five digital copies. I gave a digital copy in the film reel, reel to the Pennsylvania History Museum, a digital copy to the Library of Congress, one to the University of Illinois Library, kept one for myself, and I think I gave one to the public library. Um, it's now available on YouTube, right? So this is great, but what is YouTube? YouTube is, again, a private, it's a, it's a it's a company, it's not a, it's not a public library. There's no responsibility long range. I don't know what YouTube's plan is for long range preservation of its content. So all of this is vulnerable and I didn't give a great answer to your question except to say that I don't know personally what that answer is. I think we just have to kind of, I mean there are lots and lots of, not lots, there, are, there is software you can buy to, be your own, to do your own cataloging of your, di your visual digital content. Um, back up, back up, back up. Hi, Joseph. Hi. So, first of all, great presentation. And with your work with the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts, like you said, private companies like YouTube or Flickr or Amazon are not necessarily uh, asking the same sorts of questions as historians and genealogists are or material culture specialists. So what are some things that we can do uh, that could help the national help make the importance of the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Endowment for the Arts, and other causes where we can get the infrastructures to preserve these types of things so that generations can benefit from them in the future? That is a fantastic question, and I, I'm really grateful that you asked it. Um, because if you care about this subject, um, you know, the National Endowment for the Humanities has funded many digitization and preservation and access projects, as has the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the IMLS. Both of those um, agencies are currently um, on the chopping block. Um, our president does not want to fund them, and we, he has already said many times that he intends to have those agencies eliminated. If you would like to support them, this would be the week to do it. If you live in Chris Stewart's district, you can send him an email and just ask him to please support the NEH, the NEA, the IMLS. These are the organizations, the federal agencies that are going to make it possible for us to preserve our cultural commonwealth. Um, they are, their annual budgets are literally a rounding error in the federal budget. Cutting them will change nothing in the big picture of things and it will really be devastating for our, for our democracy. So I, I hope that if this is something you care about that you will please consider um, writing to your representatives and letting them know that you care. Uh, I'm Kevin Clyde, one of the board members for the Archive, and Aline is my mother. And uh, I think about uh, this lecture tonight and how helpful it is in doing things for our Archive. People are asking me all the time, uh, how can I get my things into the Archive? I've just got to go through them and organize them first. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Just call Liz or someone else. Uh, Greg or others to come and pick them up so that they can go through them and make sure you don't throw anything away. I'm having this challenge with my mother. <laughs> she has some things she doesn't think are important and she wants to throw them away or set them aside or organize them out of the way. Don't do that. But this archive wants to preserve the latter half of the 20th century, particularly the works of women. And so if you're in that category, don't throw anything away. <laughs> Give us a call. We come with our van. We pick it up. We do it for you, and uh, take care of it. And uh, please preserve all that Thank stuff. You. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one more question. One more question. Okay. With all the stuff we have, and it's wonderful getting access to it, finding it, categorizing, indexing. Is anyone going to school to learn this stuff? <laughs> I mean, it, literally yeah. sometimes this is the way that um, I'm having, I'm struggling yeah. to find things that I know are there. Yeah. I've seen them, how do I get them digitally? 
Greg, do you want to try to answer that? I'll let a librarian. We do in, indeed have staff that are very good at taking your collection and organizing it, articulating what it is, building a digital register that can be put out online that describes your collection and draws the scholars or individuals interested in um, researching through the materials that you have. So it's, uh, as Kevin was saying, uh, we can do the, that end of it. We need you to step forward and introduce us to your collection. So I have found that one of the sad things, I mean this group is not one that needs this lecture, <laughs> but it's the younger generation. And if our things aren't properly labeled and stored correctly to make them look important, they're being thrown out. And a lot, I'm finding this in my own business that I do. So um, just, that's really important. Great, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Thanks, good night. <laughs>
I'd like to announce that eminently there will be available the Chieko and Okazaki uh, materials. They will be available for viewing online or in person at our archive here. So that's very exciting, something that we're very proud of. Um, once again, thank you for all of your support and for the love that we feel as, as we're here tonight. And good night. <laughs>Thank you, Ms. Madden. As we close this evening's program, I would like to thank our speaker again, Dean Diane Harris, for her inspiring presentation, Ms. Madden for her response from the Clyde family, and Eileen Clyde and the entire Clyde Advisory Board for their support and participation in developing the Clyde Archive. I'd like to acknowledge our major donors, including the Clyde family, the W.W. Clyde Company, Annette Cumming, and Dr. Gregory Prince. I'd also like to thank the Friends of the Library for their support. And I give a very special thanks to my dear colleague, Dr. Greg Thompson, Associate Dean for Special Collections, and his entire staff for their dedication and hard work in making tonight's event a success. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being here tonight. An archive requires support from the community in order to grow and flourish. We're asking for your help. Um, following along with what other people have said, and asking your help in identifying the collections of women whose lives should be represented in this important archive. We are seeking to acquire the photographs, diaries, correspondence, and the writings of women who helped reflect the diversity in this country and who represent all religious, ethnic, and racial groups across the U.S. To accomplish these goals, we are also asking for your financial support. And your program is a donation card and envelope. A contribution of any amount will help us to continue to preserve and process these wonderful collections and make them available to the community. You may also indicate on this donation card if you're interested in contributing materials to the archive. So please now take this opportunity to visit with each other, enjoy the refreshments. If you need a parking validation, you can get them from the library staff in the back of the room. Again, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Good night. Thank you.